So the answer is always the same and yet unique for every expression. So the answer is always by doing it yourself. And when children, like any child who's past the age of not really having intellectual ability, they don't really care what people tell them. They care about the intangibles. They care about seeing how people actually live. And it's like, if you ask someone, what do you believe? People can tell you anything they want. I believe in Hashem, I believe in growth, I believe in Talmud Torah, I learn the Torah all day, and I love this. And, but just watch them, just watch how they act, and that's when you see what they believe. Right? If you believe that learning Torah is amazing, but every time you're not at work, you're watching you know, the Jets game, and you're drinking the beer, and you're hanging out and talking about nothing, you don't really think Torah is amazing. You think that you're supposed to think Torah is amazing. Right? And if you think that growth is amazing, but every time something is hard, you give up, and you also don't enjoy the process, and you don't do things that are difficult because you don't like discomfort, you are not going to intangibly express the value that life is about pushing forward and growing and living a purposeful, mission-oriented life and that everything is opportunity and that I want to be more. It's like you can tell your kids that all you want and when they're like very young, that's nice, but they will see. Welcome back to the Jews Next Door podcast, where we explore a different topic of our parenting hierarchy each month with the goal of raising the next generation of passionate and committed Jews. I'm your host, Rabbi Irmanchel, and in this episode, we will help you to know how to prepare your children for the Yom Neroim, for Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, with Rabbi Shmuel Reichman, who is the amazing author of The Journey to Your Ultimate Self with Mosaic Press, and a special thank you to Mosaic Press for sponsoring this episode, and the CEO of Self Mastery Academy, and so many incredible things that, that he is up to, and really a special thank you for, for taking the time to talk to us. Pleasure is all mine, so good to be here, and I'm very much looking forward to this. Same here, same here. So, you know, what, what would you say are the most important themes of the Yom Rhyme that parents should make sure to give over to their children? And then I guess, you know, we'll add on to that. How do they do it in a way that it's really felt by their children? It's a magical question. It's a very, it's a loaded question because there's basically three layers here. I would say number one is to understand the fundamentals of parenting. Number two is to understand the fundamentals of Yom Narem. And number three is like the essential connection between the two and how to really engage in Chinuch. So like, we're not going to go like as deep as we would need to, because I would probably take a couple hours in terms of really developing these themes. But I think like the most crystallized, the most powerful form of understanding parenting is basically a two-stage process of becoming the best and greatest and truest version of yourself and then helping your children do the same. And if the journey to your true self is finding your unique purpose and finding how to become the true you, which is basically like the most powerful form of life. It's based on the Gemara, Nida Da Flamina Mabez, that when you were in that fetal stage before you were born, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed you who you're supposed to become. And the Gemara says that you were shown, you know, the Lush and the Gemara is you learned Kol Torah Kula and then you lost it right before you were born. And the Vilna Gone explains that it doesn't mean that you were just taught Torah and you lost it because it wouldn't make sense. Like, what's the purpose of teaching you Torah and then making you lose it? Right. It's that you're being shown the purpose of life. More importantly, you're being shown your purpose. And you didn't lose it, you lost access to it. And the entire purpose of life is going on the journey of self discovery and growth and self transformation and self awareness and becoming you. And then parenting is nothing other than the next stage in that process, which is helping your children do the same thing. Not becoming you and not becoming just this generic cookie cutter version of, you know, a good Evan Hashem, but becoming their true self, their unique forms of how they will become a true Evan Hashem. Chanoch Lanar Al Pidarko, their derech, meaning allowing them to go find their derech and, and help them, help them with their derech. Exactly. And if you are someone who is actually doing that yourself, I mean, you are in love with the journey of life, you're in love with Torah, you're in love with Hashem, you're in love with Klai Israel, you are you know, overcoming struggles and realizing that your challenges are building you, not breaking you, and they're helping you become you know, more of the greatest version of you. It's like when you build muscle, you have to tear it apart. You want to build your emotional muscle, you got to go through struggle. You want to grow intellectually, you got to you know, grapple with difficult questions. You want to grow existentially and spiritually, you have to really 
push, you, you, you need the pressure to grow. And that's, that's how you transform yourself. And that's how you help your children grow is you give them a path of somewhat controlled challenge and struggle to really help them become the greatest version of themselves and to go through the journey of self-discovery and to go through the journey of then, like that's what parenting is, the first stage of impact. Sure. And if you can impact children that are in your family, you can also impact people outside your family, you know, your bigger family, the collective community, you know, clients around the world. So then the Yom and the Ram become very different because again, every concept in Torah has many layers. So on the simple very unabstract level, teshuva is repentance. And Yom Narayim is a time of din, time of yira, fear. And all of those things have negative connotations, right? So a lot of people have a very, very negative, it's not even like somewhat, it's, it's somewhat subconscious where there's this dread of El. Yeah, it's like this intensity. You, you know, yeah, like they tell the stories of, you know, on Rosh Chodesh Elo or when you, on Shabbos and Varkham Elo and like they would faint, you know, like, but I, that, I feel like that doesn't exist the same way anymore nowadays. So it doesn't exist the same way. And there are many reasons for that. So you basically have different people who approach Elo, Yom Narim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. There are people who are, you know, classic 18th, 19th, you know, early 20th century, you know, pale, don't talk. Din, Yira, focus, dread. It's not time to be happy. It's not time to be joyful. It's not time to be optimistic. You have to really, really focus on Cheshbon and Nefesh. And this is a time where, like, you know, it's, it's all serious. It's no fun and games. And your life is on the line. And then there's the Machshava approach, which is so deep, it's powerful, it's inspiring. Then there's the Machshava Hasidic approach, which is, no, it's not really Din, it's not really here. You have to focus on the Avi, you have to focus on the positivity. And like, these are all pieces of the puzzle, because they're all somewhat pieces of the truth. And it's like, like one of my favorite stories is a kid goes into just a local store, and he asks, can I use your phone? And the owner of the shop says, sure, you can use my phone. He goes on the phone, and he calls up, number and the person who owns the store is like listening in calls up and says hi how you doing um you know i mow people's lawn and i'd love to mow your lawn can i please mow your lawn and the person on the other side says oh sorry we actually have someone who mows our lawn and he does a great job we're not looking for anyone and he says no you don't understand like i'm not just going to mow your lawn i'm going to pull out the weeds i'm going to trim i'm going to make it look beautiful i'm going to water it i'm going to shape it up it's going to be the best lawn you've ever seen and the person on the other side said, no, you don't understand. Like the person who does our lawn already does all that. He does an amazing job. Like we're not looking for anyone else. And he says, like, I promise you, it's going to be the best ever. And the person says, no, like, we're not looking for him. I'm sorry. And he hangs up. And the person who owns the store, like, goes over and says, like, yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I know you really wanted that job. And uh, you must be feeling pretty bad. So the kid has a smile on his face. He says, no, you understand. I already had the job. I just wanted to see how I was doing. <laughs> Uh, I love that. That's a great so, story. <laughs> so like, that's how I think of L, right? L, like if you understand that the purpose of life is to actualize your potential, to become the greatest version of yourself, to contribute your life to Kleistral, to contribute your life to building a family, to building a sense of purpose and mission and really living that type of life, then L is just the recalibration of checking in and seeing how you're doing, which L is all year long. Tshuva is all year long, right? The Balaam Shabbat talk about how the whole journey of life is to Shuva back to your fetal self, back to your true self. So L is tapping into a higher level, a higher level of really a centralized focus where the whole Zman is focused on Shuva. But that doesn't mean that that disappears once you pass L. It doesn't mean that L is something completely unique. It's a very hyper focus. Oh, I feel like that's why Chazal put Slach Lanu in Shemona Esrei for us to constantly be thinking about it. It's not just one month of the year and then the rest of the year it's like, okay, we're good to go. No, there's a, you know, we should constantly be on our minds a little bit of, you know, a little, a little bit of Cheshman Okay, we take it a little more up a notch, you know, but. Exactly. And that, that's by the power and beauty of Torah is that everything is within everything. Everything's contained within everything. Everything connects everything. But then there's expressions that have a unique more potent focus of the ideas that connect everything. So like yeah. Zman Chirusin, like we're free all year long, like living a life of Torah mitzvahs is Zman Chirusin all year long, but Pesach Nisan is where we tap into that. You know, Zman Man Torah Seinu. Like the Ramban says that you have to always feel like you're back at Man Torah. It's not like a sure. once a year experience, but we, 
emphasize the unique potent expression of the end specific point. So L is where we tap into not how bad you are, not how much you mess up, not how much you don't, you're not worthy of connecting to Hashem or having a unique place in Klai or living a life of greatness and purpose and mission and, and simcha and, and fulfillment. But L is where you basically make that phone call and you check in. You say like, how am I doing? Like I already have the job. Hashem created me. I'm here in this world, but how am I doing? And then you think like, why do people have the same New Year's resolutions every year, right? Mm-hmm. Why do people statistically in the you know secular world, January fifteenth, ninety percent of people have already given up their New Year's resolutions, right? Why? And, and the real reason is because of that same dread that we have when it comes naturally to L, which is because there's two ways to approach the process of self development. One is how bad I am, how insignificant I am, how much of a failure I am, how much I always mess up, how much I never commit to my commitments, how I never follow through. I always have the same goals every year. I'm just going to be the way I am forever. And my goals make me feel bad about myself. And the other approach is the opportunity and excitement and the exuberant, overwhelming satisfaction of I get to go on the journey of growth. And if you fall in love with the process of growth, if you look at learning Torah as I get to learn Torah, if you look at Abu Hashem as I get to devote my life to truth, if you look at building a marriage as I get to go through the difficult journeys, like relationships are the most difficult things in the world. Because you think about how, how difficult self-development is. Right? Self-development is literally it's you against you. Am I going to exercise? I have to develop the discipline to push myself. Am I going to learn Torah? I develop the discipline to push myself intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. Am I going to grow in my needos? I have to grow my self-awareness and getting out of my comfort zone. Am I going to grow in being a good parent? I have to you know, become more patient. I have to recognize who my child is and that it's just not quid pro quo. It doesn't work like I ask, it happens. I want it, it happens. Like there's the fact that all like self-development is one of the hardest things in the world, but inter self-development where as much as right. it's impossible to control yourself fully, you cannot control another person at all, literally at all. Like you can influence, you can inspire, you can try to do it. in like, we'll talk about, you know, good and bad ways to, to impact people, but you don't control another person's will. The essence sure. of life is Bechir, is free will. So as much as inner self-development is hard, inter self-development, intra self-development is, is the most difficult thing, and yet it's the most amazing thing. So a marriage is impossible, and yet Ezra Kinegu has many different levels. It's one thing, it's literally opposites that create you know, chaos, and the other hand, it's opposite that creates harmony, creates oneness, and beautiful. And the result of that coming together of two different worlds is building a family. And then when you have children, you know, it just, again, there's a chaos element if I just can't control anything. Like I right. want to make an amazing family. I want to raise an amazing family and I can't. And once you recognize that you can't control, but you can inspire and you can impact and the best way to impact others is to take full accountability for yourself, then self-development becomes the most amazing part of life that I can always that- be back how do we get our child to, to be on that growth, you know, have a growth mindset like that, to be able to be looking at how can I self, you know, discover and how can I, you know, like you said, the main theme of checking in, checking in, this is, this is, oh, well, it's just a time of checking in. It doesn't have to be this whole intense aim of a facha, this intense, you know, dread. No, just, you know, I'm checking in. How am I doing that phone call? How do we give that over to our children? So the answer is always the same and yet unique for every expression. So the answer is always by doing it yourself. And when children, like any child who's past the age of not really having intellectual ability, they don't really care what people tell them. They care about the intangibles. They care about seeing how people actually live. And it's like, if you ask someone, what do you believe? People can tell you anything they want. I believe in Hashem, I believe in growth, I believe in Talmud Torah, I learn the Torah all day, and I love this. And, but just watch them. Just watch how they act, and that's when you see what they believe. Right? If you believe that learning Torah is amazing, but every time you're not at work, you're watching you know, the Jets game, and you're drinking a beer, and you're hanging out and talking about nothing, you don't really think Torah is amazing. You think that you're supposed to think Torah is amazing. Right, mm-hmm. And if you think that growth is amazing, but every time something is hard, you give up, 
and you also don't enjoy the process and you don't do things that are difficult because you don't like discomfort, you are not going to intangibly express the value that life is about pushing forward and growing and living a purposeful mission oriented life and that everything is opportunity and that I want to be more. It's like you can tell your kids that all you want and when they're like very young, that's nice, but they will see. We'll be right back to our episode in just a moment. But first, a word about our sponsors who so graciously sponsored today's episode. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mosaic Press for sponsoring this episode. Mosaic Press is coming out literally weekly with new titles, new books that cover every single topic from parenting to Sean Bias to Tshuva. Really, if, I mean, if you, if, you know, if you know their stuff, you know that you have incredible quality, great stuff. Thank you so much again for sponsoring this episode and you surely check out their stuff, mosaicopress.com. Check them out on Instagram. They're on Twitter. They're, they are everywhere. You should check them out. Thank you again for your sponsorship and your support. Right. No, for sure. You have to, a hundred percent, you have to model. So I'm, I guess let's, let's take it one step further. Let's say you yourself are doing it. You are entering into a Cheshwan and Nefesh and you're, you know, really trying to see how yourself, how you can grow and how you can, you know, checking in during this time period your child sees you doing it and then they want to understand better what is going on. How do you give it over to them? How do you explain it to them in a way that can speak to a child? And obviously this depends on the ages. So obviously mm-hmm. let's, let's start with younger so children. Let's, and then let's, build build way let's, up build children. let's build that. So once you have the modeling in place, then you want to express the model in a way that's palatable, meaningful, enjoyable to them. So for example, a lot of parents, they want their kids to be like them, right? And it's amazing when your kids want to be like you. It's like, you know, you're a rabbi, you want your kid to, you know, want to be a rabbi. You're a doctor, you want your kid to be a doctor. You're in business, you want your kid to join the family business. But the next layer is getting outside that ego of my kid is either a small me or the only way I'm going to be a successful parent is if they're like me or the only way I can understand them is if they're like me. And you say, I want to understand them for their sake so I can help them become them. So then it's like, okay, I really enjoy A. But that's not what I'm going to help my kid enjoy. I want to understand who my kid is and what they understand, what they enjoy. And then I'm going to reflect the value that I believe in. Like, Let's say like, let's give a generic example. This is true in every aspect of life. It's like there are many layers of Torah, right? Halacha, Gemara, Gemara Be'in, Machshava, Musr, Hashkafa, yeah. different things, Tanakh, right? When it comes to business, when it comes to entrepreneurship, when it comes to professional trajectories, when it comes to types of relationships, when it comes to athletics, we're mathematically inclined, emotionally inclined, interpersonally inclined. So finding, helping your kids really become self-aware and find their their, their connection to every area of their self in life and then they, they have a specific goal like i want i want this rosh Hashan to be more meaningful right so what can you do so you can first help them understand what we're trying to like the the, the idea of connecting to Hashem, the idea of connecting to yourself of connecting to life. so based on their age let's say they're 18 right let's say they're 18 and they can intellectually understand the idea so if they don't have a, a deep connection to why we're blown chauffeur and the essence of his chachos and, and newness and opportunity. And that on Rosh Hashanah, we don't even mention any element of, w- w- there's no real kapara focus. There's no element of trying to mention our sins. Why? And we don't even talk about ourselves. It's all about klal, klal Yisrael. Everything is in the, the plural. So, you know, it's like everything is basically collective. Why? And to help them understand that w- as much as you are important as an individual, we're trying to tap into something bigger than ourselves. The most amazing way to live a life of purpose is not to be an individual, but to be an individual who's fully an individual, but still part of something bigger than themselves. So it's right. like, then you can say, let's say they love sports. So you give analogies of sports teams and how, you know, you have a leader who's an individual on a team and the team basically is always going to be a failure because you need to be part of something bigger than yourself. And if they love music, then you can give the analogy of, you know, an orchestra. And how if one player in the orchestra tries to like stand outside, 
it's chaos. So the harmony and beauty of an orchestra is everyone playing their piece and their instrument coming together as something bigger than themselves. If they love Torah, you show them a sugya. And you see the beauty of a sugya is not just understanding the Rambam or the Ramban or Abinu Tam or the Ritva, the Rashba. It's the beauty of the whole sugya. And so, learning so how let's to target that towards towards the theme of, of Rosh Hashanah then. You know, I mean, how do you help them to tap into something that's interesting for them vis-a-vis Rosh Hashanah? I mean, like what what does that look like actually, like practically speaking? So the, the practical is always the natural expression of the idea. Right. So the first thing is you want to understand their language. Right, if they're five, if they're fifteen, and if they're twenty-five, if they're fifty, right? Chinuch and parenting never stops. So there's always that conversation. But let's assume like we're dealing with like, you know, zero to eighteen. So the first thing is you want to understand the ideas of Rosh Hashanah yourself. So we're tapping into the ideas of Chuva, which is really returning to your true self, returning to Klai Yisrael, and returning to Hashem. So that means having a connection to yourself, having a connection to Klai Yisrael, and having a connection to Hashem. And there's the idea of shofar, like on a simple level, the Rambam, the Rambam talks about the wake-up call of literally just waking up. But then there are deeper ideas of really a shofar is not only waking up, but waking up to go back to your true self, to go back to Klai, so to go back to Hashem. Right. And then you have a conversation with your, your kid. And let's say, you know, we'll choose like, you know, a high school age, you know, 15. So first, you don't teach, you ask. So you ask First of all, to get them thinking, and second of all, so that you understand what they understand. You understand their connection to Rosh Hashanah and Elul, and where they connect to it, where they don't connect to it, where they're struggling, where they love it, what do they enjoy about it, what do they hate about it. Maybe they see it as, you know, why do I have to sit in shul all day and just like, you know, talk to God? Like, this is just, it's, it's you know, we, we're not going to even get into Yom Kippur, which is a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. Rosh Hashanah, we're eating. It's, you know, not that long of a davening. But if you're not connected to davening, it's like Rosh Hashanah requires an understanding of self-development, Kla Yisrael, Hashem, Tefillah, Teshuva. And it's like, there's a, there's a lot here, right? right. So you don't want to take them through a 25-hour lecture, but you also want to empower them with the tools so that they realize how awesome living a Torah life is and how deep it is, how meaningful it is, and how everything they want. They want to feel like they belong. They want to feel like their life is meaningful. They want to be happy. They want to feel significant. They want to really just like feel good about themselves. They want to feel like they're not a failure. They want to feel like they have potential. They want to feel like they're already good enough, and yet they want to be more. And a lot of people, they don't feel like they have permission to really talk about this. They also don't believe if they haven't been given like a deeper framework for Torah life, that Torah is giving them what they want. They feel like they have to give up who they are to become an Ebed Hashem. As in, I want to go in that direction in life. I want to get this job. I love this. And Torah is telling me that I have to basically be a monotonous, mindless follower of rituals that I don't understand, doing things I don't understand, saying things I don't understand to a God that I've never seen. And why? So opening up to the level that they can connect to, to give them a deeper meaning requires, number one, doing it yourself for yourself, which is always the prerequisite. And number two is to understand where your children are. It's not your children because each child is their own universe. Each child is literally a collection of their self, their experiences, their struggles, their perceptions, how they've seen you, how their teachers have talked to them, how their friends have basically engaged with them, what they've read, what they've seen, what they've watched. And it's 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 a full-time job taking care of yourself and going on your own journey of growth, right? And then you're working on your marriage and then you're working on your kids. So it's like, it's not easy. And there's a reason why it's overwhelming. There's a reason why we a lot of a lot of parents kind of just kind of give it to the Rebbeim and the Moras as like it's their job to right. do this, and I don't have to do this. But the fundamentals that the Rambam talks about, and the Shla talks about, and the, and Rav Hirsch talks about this, that the fundamental nature of the mitzvah pruvu is not just to physically bring children into this world, but the second half of that mitzvah is to be their mechanic, is to help them grow spiritually, is to fill up the vessel that you've brought into this world to help them actualize their potential. So it is right. the parent's job. And you so can give... Let's, 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 but let's get back to, you know, specifically on this on this component of Rosh Hashanah, right? Meaning, 
because I, I want to get as practical as possible, right? For the for the listeners who are trying to understand, okay, but now what do, what do I do with that? I don't give it. Give let's go. Let's drill into specifically Rosh Hashanah, right? What, take let's take one theme. Let's take either Tfila or Shofar, Din, any of those. How how do how do I speak to my child about it? Meaning I've I've already gone through myself, hundred percent. Let, we'll, we'll go with that as an assumption. Now now what do what does a parent do? So the answer is. First, selecting the thing that you're going to do. Because I agree, it's 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 best to choose one meaningful nugget and to really allow that to be the centralized focus. Even if you add additional ones, like there's one tangible one where it's like, let's say you talk to your kid and they tell you, like, I don't understand why we daven. Like, why are we daven? Like, what, why? Like, I'm like, I don't understand why we daven all year long, but Rosh Hashanah and getting Jim Kippur, it's like, there's so much davening. Right. And let's say they ask real questions. Like, what's the point? Like, I don't even really understand the words. And like, if God's so all knowing, he already knows what I want. So why do I need to tell him what I want? Right. And if, you know, God loves me, if Hashem loves me, he's going to give me what I want, even if I don't ask for it. And, you know, if it's, if I'm not supposed to get it, even if I ask for it, he's not going to give it to me. Right. So why are we doing this? And let's say you have a relationship with your child that they actually want to know and you can actually, you know, have that conversation with them. So you can focus on like one idea, which is that why do we daven? We can basically like build it into a couple layers, but the real idea of davening is not to change Hashem's mind, but it's to change ourselves. Right. And that's, that's the essence that brings everything together. It brings El together. It brings Teshuva together. It's really the essence of Shofar as well. It's that we're not changing Hashem, we're changing ourselves. Mm. And what is davening? Like when you work on yourself, you don't change externally, you change internally. Right? So if you don't do something and then you did it, why did that change happen? Something changed internally. Some shift occurred. Right. And that's the essence of Ratzon. That's why Tfila is called Abodah Salev. So first of all, it's the most amazing idea of all time, and it's the most amazing idea for anyone who hasn't heard this. But for a child who goes their whole life thinking, I'm talking to a God that I don't see, that doesn't really interact with me, that I don't talk to like meaningfully because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm saying these words I don't understand. Like, what's the purpose of all this? And then you realize that, first of all, everything that happens to you is Hashem's conversation with you. That, you know, Hashem is not human, but Hashem is interacting with you all the time. And davening is where you tap deeper into yourself where you connect yourself. So you, you can focus on one fila in the Rosh Hashanah davening, or you can focus on one aspect or just a general idea and say, like, think about when you really want something. Like you're going deeper into yourself, you're really focusing on your ratzah, you're focusing on your will. And to change your will and say, I want to be better. I want to be more. I want to fall in love with growth. I want to be connected to Hashem. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better person. I want... That's what davening is. It's working on your wants. It's working on you. It's self-transformation. And when you change yourself, that's the essence of tshuva. Because you're not supposed to change yourself. So you're supposed to become more of yourself. And the whole idea of teshuva is if you do something wrong, you get the natural repercussion. It's like if you smoke, chas v'shalom, you, you don't, like you go to the doctor and they say like, chas v'shalom, you know, so someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, you have, you know, lung cancer because you smoked for 20 years saying you're sorry doesn't work right, right. yeah it's like i'm sorry the doctor's like yeah i forgive you but like there's nothing i can do so why right. would the work you know saying you're sorry because chuva is not saying you're sorry chuva is self-transformation it's becoming mm -hmm. someone else so if you shift and you're no longer the person who did it like imagine all of a sudden you have a new body because you are a new person but the idea is not to change the idea is to grow and you're not changing or just growing sun, you're becoming your true self. So the more you are no longer the person who did that wrong thing, the cup, the, the onash, the consequence is no longer going to you because you're no longer that person. So right. understanding how the essence of that is tefillah, because tefillah is working on your true self, working on your inner desires, working on your inner self, your inner self-awareness, your inner consciousness. And for a kid who just has this rote, meaningless connection to davening, to all of a sudden be giving a gift of I get to connect to myself in connect Hashem during davening, and then shofar. Like shofar is the, the paradigmatic mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah. It's the essence of tefillah because tefillah is going why, to why be this part of yourself. 
And what's shofar? Shofar, shofar is a soundless cry. So much of the way Chazal talk about shofar is crying, right? Crying is beyond words. Like when you can't express something in words, you have this existential emotional feeling, where like everything is either falling apart for the good or for the bad, you cry. It's the deepest, right. most unverbal expression of sound. And shofar is going to the deepest. That's why also shofar literally means l'shaper, to improve, to make better in the truest form. Also, me shafir, those fetal fluids that you were surrounded with in the womb when you were your perfect true self back at your root, it's the same root as shofar, right? Because mm-hmm. the essence of shofar is going back to the deepest part of you, going back to that soundless part of you. Like when you speak, you take your ideas in your head that are, you know, hard to quantify, you express them into words. But when you're beyond sound, you're going back to that root part of yourself. And the idea of is going back to your true self, going back to the root of Klai Yisrael, going back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? It's basically tracing ourselves back to our root. And when you tell your children, we're not just blowing a shofar because we're trying to like physically wake people up from sleeping, which is like, that's true as well. It's a wake up call, but it's tapping into the theme of going back to our true self, going back right. to Hashem, going, <clears throat> when they hear it, they can experience that. Because sure. now they have a physical foundation and shofar is, 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 a, is a base throughout the Rosh Hashanah da- davening. So now right. throughout the whole davening, they're not just connecting to the abstract idea of I'm trying to become my true self, but you know the, the way the Rosh Hashanah talked about it is that there's so many themes you're supposed to be thinking about while you hear the shofar, but if you don't have those themes to think about, chauffeur is just a random trumpet sound. Totally. Right? So now you give you give them a concrete base, which helps them throughout the whole daven and connect back to the idea of what Rosh Hashanah is about, which is the most Amazing. powerful way to experience Rosh Hashanah. Daven. Right, right. Amazing. What would you say in terms of the the simanim? You know, it's like I feel like a very like popular item, but. It might, it, it's some, some people just kind of, it's like, like a ritual, but how do you make it something that's a little more, a little more meaningful for, for children, for like younger children and older children, you know, how do we, how do we look at that as a. So again, again, the answer always has to start with building a deeper connection to it yourself, right? If you ask most adults, like, what's your approach to Simanim? Like, what are the deeper ideas of Simanim? They'll say like. I don't know, like, you know, we so, just, so give us, so give us, so give us some deeper idea on it. So the first, it's the same thing, by the way, for Pesach, for the Seder play, for the Kara. The essence of Simanim is teaching people how to live a spiritual life in a physical world. Because it's like, think about it right now, right? You are seeing, you know, if people are watching this, you're seeing my face, but you're also tapping into my mind. How? Because through the physical surface, you're seeing my facial expression, my body language, you're hearing the words I'm saying, how I'm saying them. And all of a sudden you're seeing the infiniteness of my mind, even though that's impossible. Like, how are you able, like, you can't see my thoughts. You can't see my soul, myself. How are you, how are you tapping into that which is abstract through a physical vessel? The answer is we do it automatically. And that's the essence of living a Torah life is everything physical is deeper than it seems and represents something more. So that's how you learn to, live with abstraction as opposed to like most people think that it's a philosopher's game to like deepen everything and see the wisdom behind everything you do it naturally like right now you are literally tapping into something infinite through a physical medium it's the essence of mitzvahs like we if you, the the essence of living a torah life you would think would be spiritual right be a buddhist be a buddhist monk meditate on your navel transcend the physical world and just focus on Hashem, focus on meaning, focus on purpose. That's not what Torah life is. It's like, name me all the spiritual mental mitzvot there are. Maybe like you can name on one hand, like believe in Hashem, don't serve idolatry, don't be jealous. Like every mitzvah is physical. Shake a lulav, eat matzah, blow shofar. It's like, why are we so physical? So what does that have to do with the simanim? You're saying it's, so it's meant to the be The essence a- of the simanim is you show, and it's not just for the kids, it's for ourselves as well. You take physical things, you know, pieces of food, just a thing, just a piece of food. It's not. Everything means something. Everything has a deeper layer of conceptual meaning. And from the surface, you deepened it. So you take the simanim and you, first of all, the ideas of the simanim of laying down the roots for a powerful year, for a year of tova, sof ma'asat machshavet chila, like you can't accomplish anything meaningful unless you have a meaningful foundation. It's like you plant a seed, that seed grows into a tree. You have a zygote, it grows into a full human being. If you plant the seeds for a good year 
it grows into a good year. So part of it is really building in the foundation. Nothing good happens by accident. You start the year out with really focusing on where you want this year to go, tapping into where it's coming from. It's coming from Hashem. But then there's the most meaningful layer, which is that everything in the world is meaningful and deeper. And then you ask, like, why is this simon for this? Why are we focusing on, you know, the apple for this and, you know, carrot for this and this for that? And you start to see how you can do that for everything. And that the beauty of Torah is that everything means something. Everything. Mm -hmm. Because we're not just in a physical world to, like, philosophers would basically argue, and the classic medieval philosophers, the world's just a place. The world of ideas and truth is outside the world. You're supposed to basically just figure out how to tap into that, not through this world, but essentially transcending it. The Torah perspective of Yichud Hashem and oneness and physical as an expression of the spiritual and mitzvah, Maral talks about mitzvah as tzavta, connecting, connecting to Hashem through physical action. Why? Because the physical is the most expressed form of the spiritual. So when you have a kid who doesn't believe that the things that happen to him are meaningful and that the fact that he's in this world, you know, why the fact that you have two hands, that you have a face, like, why is your head over here? Like, why is your heart over here? Why is, like, why is anything, anything? If you don't believe there's an answer to that, if you don't believe there's meaning behind everything, it's very easy to essentially fall into the trap of there is no meaning. And you just like basically say, like, I'm done with this. Like, it's, as you're saying, using this as a paradigm to show that everything has something more to it. There's there's depth to everything. And and that's like one another thing that you can give over to your children on Rosh Hashanah as well, right? Just explaining that concept. And like you said, showing how even physical items, everything has that spiritual component to it. And also just everything has a, a, a level of, of depth to it. Exactly, exactly. And, and it, it, the, the climax could be that they're still like, like finding where they find meaning, as in what they're inclined to, what they find more meaningful. Because that gets sure. back into the personalization. Because if you just sure. abstract it, some kids, but some kids love the abstract, some kids hate the abstract. Some kids literally, unless it's as practical as can be, they just feel like you're talking, you know, either at them or above them. And it's like, what does this mean to me? Other kids, if you don't give them the deeper abstract foundation, they don't respect it. They feel like it's not really. And we fall into the trap of thinking that kids that want it, don't want it, and the kids that don't want it, do want it. And like understanding how to, and that's why it's very difficult. Like if you're in a classroom, and you're speaking to 20 kids, they're all in different levels. So challenging the kids on certain levels while not talking above kids on other levels is not easy. Same thing for family dynamics. You have one child, it's easy, right? You have three, it's a little more difficult. You have eight, you have 12, it's not. So you have to build the personal relationships and the collective experiences for the whole family. Sure. And that's 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 being a master mechanic, which is the responsibility of your parent, even though you want to think like, no, nah, like I'm just an accountant, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I don't need to be a mechanic. But it's you know, it's it's the essence of building a family is raising that family. It's not easy, but it's, yeah. it's definitely worth it. There's two more questions I want to ask you. We have, we're limited on time, but I wanted to ask you two more questions. There's a a, two, a major theme of of Malchus, right? Of, of of Hashem's king kingship and and him us us crowning Hashem, right? Hashem who Elokim, Hashem Hashem Melch. You know that that concept on on Rosh Hashanah especially. How can we get our children to genuinely feel that they are, so to speak, placing the crown on Hashem's hem? Head when that's something that's it's, it's it's a deep idea it's a hard idea but that's it's such an you know important theme to Rosh Hashanah. How can we help a child to 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 tap into that that aspect of uh, of Rosh Hashanah as well? So I think it's more complicated than we realize because not only is it the most important part of Rosh Hashanah, but Malchus and the concept of kingship has such a bad subliminal and subconscious connotation in people's minds because of the past 1,000 years of world mm -hmm. history. So if we believe that we're crowning Hashem as king and we believe that kings are corrupt, egotistical, tyrannical, and essentially the worst paradigm of leadership, and that's why we've replaced it with democracy, then there's such a level of untalked about complication 
in no, children are probably not necessarily. So it depends on how old they're talking about. Depends right? on how old. If you're dealing with let's say six to twelve, of they're probably yes. not necessarily there. Twelve to eighteen, yes, could could maybe have a little bit more to that. So I'd say there's two layers. The first is to understand the layers of malchus, right? There's basically three forms of leadership. One form of leadership is where I'm a leader for my own sake, right? I'm an egotistical maniac. I want power. The second is essentially where the leadership is for the people. The, the entire purpose of being a leader is just to reflect the will of the people. It's a democracy. And then the ideal leadership is true malchus, which is egoless leadership, where I am a leader who reflects nothing other than the truth. And I'm going on the journey of trying to reflect the truth and then inspire and help others connect to that as well. And then, so that's like the first stage of just kind of overcoming the problems of Malchus to begin with. But again, Malchus has two layers. One is the din aspect, which is Hashem is our Melech, as in he governs and there's the consequential element. The other is like the awe element of Hashem is the creator and ruler of the world and as the Ramam talks about, like you go into the, you know, you, you watch the night sky and you're, you're mesmerized in awe. And the greatest form of crowning someone as king is devoting your life to them. And when you believe that Hashem wants you to serve him because he's just trying to get you like, you know, like a human form of Malchus, it becomes very complicated. When you view Hashem as the source of all meaning and purpose and truth in your existence and he gave you the gift of life and he wants to help you, like he created you for you to become everything you're capable of becoming and to give you the ultimate good, then crowning him as king is really not physically putting a crown on his head, but it's devoting your life to everything that he is. So the right, best for a way, child, that's hard to that's hard to tap into. So for a child, let's talk about like young ages. For you know, six to twelve, the best way to crown Hashem as king is to love him. To just talk about like for, to to show the expression of Hashem in your life, the apple you're eating, the hands you have, the beating heart, all the good things that happen to you, and then to just create that level of like we get to devote our lives to Hashem like Hashem gives us everything and we get to live that type of life and Torah is the most amazing life like it creates a, a magnetic attraction towards Abdus Hashem as opposed to a level of like overwhelming stress and fear and like I better do what Hashem wants otherwise you know I'm going to pay the consequences for a, a young child like they don't want to have that terror oriented relationship with authority they, they need the structure but they need the nurturing as well and that's the same thing for parenting of everything needs to come it's like Olam Chasid Yibana Din enables Ava Yira enables Ava. The whole focus of los assays are for the sake of assays. So if you hyper-focus on Malchus as din and Yira and struggle and stress and like you better do what Hashem wants, otherwise he's going to come down and pounce on you, like not only is that a terrible chinuch for relating to Hashem, it's a terrible chinuch for parenting. Like that's not the way parents should govern either. You want to create the sense that everything I do is for the best for you. Like ev- whenever I punish you, it's just because I want you to be better. And everything is coming from love. So once they're older, like, you know, 15 to 18, then you want to start developing the yira, as in the Ramchal talks about, the higher yira, the awe, which is why yira comes from the same source as riya, to see. Like when you're truly aware of how amazing it is to be alive, how amazing it is to be a right. Jew, how amazing Torah Mitzvah is, you, you have all the yira and the din and the malchus within the realm of the Ava and Avinu Sheva Shemayim and the many different layers of relating to Hashem. So these things are not simple at all. They're very, very, very complicated, especially when you're trying to educate a, a five-year-old, right? And trying to give him a healthy relationship with Torah. And that's why I like you all different approaches. One is to dumb it down to the extent that it's no longer really the truth. And the biggest struggle is to express it in a way that is palatable to the five-year-old and then the seven-year-old and the nine-year-old, but it evolves as opposed to it changes. But you're not giving right, them a right. different explanation. You're giving them a deeper explanation. Totally. 
as we as we get to wrap up, I, I'm curious. You know, how would you say is the best way? Let's say at the at the yantif table, right? You're, you're eating the meal. Are there any, let's say, stories that you use? You know, go to stories that you have. Maybe you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot with like asking for a story, but any go to stories that help to give over these themes? Any of the themes that we spoke about? I know you had the story with the you know the phone call, but more a story that we can give over to to a child. Whether it's you know for that that story probably would work for the 12 to 18 type of age range, but let's say. You know, so that that might be good, and but maybe for like for younger children, or and then maybe any, any anything else for the older children as well. So I'll share. I mean, this is like the classic story, which I'm sure that like 50 percent of people have heard. It's probably the best story when it comes to Elul, and it's good for for five year olds, for 70 year olds, 25 year olds. It's like it's kind of like the the tearjerker story. But it's a story of a guy on a train, and he looks like really distraught, really serious. And he's kind of like, you know, sweating a little bit. And elderly gentleman sitting across from him says, you know, I don't mean to pry, but it looks like, you know, something is on your mind. And, you know, if I can help in any way, I'm more than happy to. And the guy says, you know, I can't believe I'm actually telling you this, but there is something on my mind. And I think maybe you could help me. And he says that about, you know, six years ago, my life changed forever. And it was basically a result of my upbringing. Like when I was a kid, I did not get along with my parents. They wanted me to be one way. I wanted to be another way. They wanted me to fit in this way. I wanted to act out that way. I just did not see eye to eye with them. We didn't share the same values, you know, spiritually, practically, financially. Like I hated my parents. My parents, I thought they hated me. And we just basically argued every single day. And when I was 18, I said, that's it. Like, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And I didn't even tell them I was leaving. I just packed up my bags and I set out. And I had plans. I was going to build my business. I was going to go on my way. And I you know, didn't want to live by their spiritual doctrines. I didn't really care about them or their values. And, you know, they sent me letters. I didn't respond to them. They tried to call me and didn't call back. And I was excited. Like, I was going to live this amazing life. I was finally free to do what I wanted to do. And I went into business, and things were going well, and I was building my life, and I met a girl, and everything was amazing. And I knew it. I knew that this is what I'd always wanted, and I was excited that I was finally able to escape and live my life. And then everything fell apart. My business partners, they went back on their word. They sabotaged the deals. They lied to me. They stole from me. I lost all my money. The girl that I was going to marry broke my heart. And I, my whole life fell apart. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anyone. I didn't know anyone. I was, it went from like thinking I was going to be a millionaire to being actually homeless. And I didn't have family. I didn't have friends. I didn't have money. I didn't have a future. I didn't really know who I was anymore. And about two weeks ago, I was basically like, I had nothing, like nothing left. I didn't know if I was going to live anymore. I didn't know if I could live anymore. And I didn't know what I was going to do basically to move on. So I, I sent the letter to my parents and I sent them a letter saying that in two weeks, I'm going to take the train past, you know, the train goes past our house and I want to basically just let you know the truth. The truth is that I messed up then I'm sorry. I, was, I wasn't the son you wanted me to be. I wasn't the son I should have been. I wasn't the person I should have been. And I disrespected you. I lied to you. I ran away from you. I didn't respond to your calls. You did so much for me. You raised me. You fed me. You nurtured me. You loved me. You cared for me. And I threw all that away. And there's no reason that you have to forgive me. There's no reason you have to let me back and to take care of me and to let me back in. But if there's any chance that you would take me back and see me again, then the tree in our front yard that the train passes, if you put a white flag or a white towel on the tree, then it, it'll let me know that you're willing to take me back. And this man now looks at this elderly gentleman and he says, You, you got cut off at the white towel. Say, say it again. So the he sends the letter and he says that, so if you're willing to take me back, if you're willing to let me back into your house, then put a white towel or a white flag on the tree in the front yard. Mm-hmm. And if you're not willing to take me back, 
then, you know, just ignore this. Don't put the tail. And I'm going to basically, the train goes past the front yard. And if I see the white tail, right. I know that you're going to let me back in and you want to take me back. And if I don't, then I know that you don't. And this, you know, young 24 year old guy looks at this elderly gentleman. He says, we're about two minutes away from passing my front house and I'm, I'm getting really nervous. And I just, I don't know if I can look. I don't know if I can handle this. It's just so stressful. And I'm freaking out a little bit. And the elderly gentleman says, do you want to just look down and I'll look for you and I can tell you if it's too stressful for you to do it. And he says, that would be amazing. That would mean so much to me. So, you know, two minutes goes by, you know, the guy's his heart's beating in his chest and he's getting so nervous. And the elderly gentleman says, like, which side? He tells him which side. And all of a sudden, this guy hears the elderly gentleman, like, gasp. And he says, look up, you have to see this. And he's looking up, thinking, like, oh my gosh, I hope there's a flag there. And he sees on the front, front lawn, he can barely see the front lawn, he can barely see the house, and he can barely see the tree. There's white towels and white flags everywhere. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds everywhere, literally. And the guy starts to just sob and cry, he gets off the train, embraces his parents, and they welcome him home. And there's this notion that I think so many people have, which is that once I make a mistake, like I'm no longer good enough. And like every parent knows that there's nothing a child can do, nothing that would ever make them stop loving them, stop wanting them, stop caring about them, stop wanting the best for them. And that's infinitely more so of Hashem in a way that you can't possibly imagine. For anyone who has this notion that God is a judgmental person that is essentially keeping tabs on you, and if you're you know, good, then good, and if not, then you're not wanted, it's very often like once you mess up, you feel like you are a mess up, and once you feel like you are a mess up, once you feel like you are a failure, you feel like you're not good enough, you're not wanted, Hashem doesn't want you. And for you to believe, and this is, a, you know, it's an emotional idea. It's a spiritual idea. It's a powerful idea. It's also the deepest intellectual, philosophical, and, and true idea in all realms of Torah. It's not just like halacha is one thing, emotion is another thing. It's like that's why there's a mitzvah of teshuva. It's not uh, Hashem allows you to do teshuva. It's that there's a mitzvah. As in Hashem wants you. Right. He wants to connect with us. Wow. What and, a powerful idea. And mm. for someone who doesn't know that, to hear that, like that's a story that can shift. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for sharing all of this wisdom with us. It was uh, really incredible. And I have no doubt that if, if parents really tap into these ideas and, and listen, listen carefully and, and to be able to both for themselves and, you know, then to, to internalize it and then to be able to give it over to their children, it will be a very, very much more impactful I'm in rhyme season for, for all of us. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure is all mine. And I, you know, I'll just close up by saying like, that order is the order of life. It's like you do it yourself and then you help others and you cannot reverse it. So like m turning yourself into your own parent and helping yourself become your true self is the best way to help your kids. And it's the most amazing 100%. way to live. hundred percent. All right. Thank you so much again. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Jews Next Door. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. I'd love to hear your takeaways. Reach out to us. Reach out to me at yair at jenoff.org. Hi at jenoff.org. You can check us out on the website. You could leave a question there. We'd love to be in touch. Please be in touch. Check us out on Instagram at Parenting The Jews Next Door. Hit me up on Twitter at Yair Manchel. And we got, we're on TikTok now too. We have some great content, a lot of really great insights into parenting, tips, parenting pointers, reaction videos, and quotes. We have a lot going on. We have a lot of articles. You want to check it out. Check it out at jenoff.org. You won't be sorry you did. And I look forward to hearing from you. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, make sure you subscribe and share it with your family and friends. Looking forward to another great episode next week.